colleague Jenna has started recording this. We do record these. Uh, for those that cannot participate, we put them on our virtual uh, program page. If you go to cmc.edu slash alumni or cmc.edu slash parents, um, you'll see uh, an area for virtual programming. Uh, and many of our recording um, recorded sessions are there uh, for you to view later. Uh, of course, everyone's busy, everyone has a lot of things going on. So hopefully if you cannot attend one of these, you can attend over the weekend or at a future date. Uh, hope everyone is, is happy and healthy. Thanks for taking the time today. My name is Evan Rutter. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at CMC. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here with Professor Livesey and all of you uh, to talk about this um, very uh, pertinent topic, um, an interesting topic. Um, Professor Livesey has helped us with a number of programs in the past, uh, including with um, an in-person program at the Pantages Theater for Hamilton. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where he was our intro prior to um, 50 alumni and parents actually watching Hamilton at the Pantages. A few things about Zoom. If you look down at the bottom, there is a chat feature and a participants feature. Uh, if you click those to the right, both should pop up. In the chat feature, you can put your name, your class year, your parent year. You can also put any questions. When we hit the Q&A portion in about a half hour, uh, 35 minutes, um, I can ask questions of um, Professor Livesey. Uh, conversely, if you want to ask the question directly in the participant section, there's a button that says raise hand. You click raise hand. I will actually call on you to directly um, ask your question to Professor Livesey and that way you can kind of get some um, uh, some conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and ask your question uh, directly. Uh, on the top right, there's both speaker view and grid view. Uh, this is your preference. My preference is, is grid view. I like to see as many people as possible. Um, but for many of you, you'd probably prefer to see um, speaker view. That way, if you're on speaker view right now, it's mostly just me with a few boxes at the top of individuals. Um, uh, and then uh, it'll change depending on who is speaking. Professor Livesey does plan on sharing his screen. Uh, so that will change in a couple of minutes. Uh, don't be alarmed, but that'll allow you to really um, participate in the, uh, in the conversation uh, and see um, what he has put together for us. So. It is now my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor of History, Daniel Livesey. He's a scholar of early American and Atlantic history. His work examines the intersection of race, family, and slavery in North America and the Caribbean. He teaches courses on slavery, Native American history, the history of the family, revolutions, and racial ideologies in the Americas. Professor Livesey's recent book, Children of Uncertain Fortune, Mixed Race Jamaicans in Britain and the Atlantic Family, chronicles the lives of hundreds of individuals born in the Caribbean to white fathers and free or enslaved mothers of color who eventually left to live with relatives in Britain. The book demonstrates how questions of family belonging were integral to conceptions of racial difference in the 18th century Atlantic world. Currently, Professor Livesey is completing work on a manuscript that analyzes what life was like for elderly enslaved people in Virginia and Jamaica. Professor Livesey is also the chair of our history department. Professor Livesey, welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your day for our alumni and parents. Well, thanks so much, Evan, and to Jenna for inviting me to do this. And thanks to all of you for, for joining along. I saw someone from Louisville, Colorado. My mom lives just up the road in Longmont, Colorado. So I hope you guys are surviving the heat wave that she's been telling me about. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really great to be able to talk to you today. I think because over the last two months, um, we've all had to, to kind of confront the issue of slavery much more directly than maybe we have in a long time. Um, after the murder of George Floyd a couple of months ago and the, the protests surrounding Black Lives Matter, um, there's been a lot more attention being called to long-standing issues of racial discrimination. And it's really pointed to the legacy of slavery as an institution as kind of a founding part of that issue of racial discrimination. And we see the ways in which there are very kind of direct um, uh, protests along that. So statues are being pulled down all across the country, uh, many of whom uh, de are depicting Confederate monuments and Confederate individuals. The Confederacy was obviously very much uh, an institution formed to protect slavery. Um, but there's also been kind of wider acknowledgments of the role of slavery in the United States. Um, there hasn't been as much attention played to indigenous slavery, although that's starting to change in recent years. And for those of you who live in California, you probably notice that there's been more calls to remove statues of uh, Junipero Serra, who was sort of the key friar in founding uh, the California mission system. And those missions are really complex sites. Today, they really serve um, for a lot of um, a Latinx people um, as a, a site for worship and as uh, community centers, but at the same time, those missions do have really complicated and, and problematic legacies. Um, they were places where extreme brutality was meted out against indigenous people in California 
And they were effectively places that enslaved indigenous people who lived and worked there. Um, for those of you who saw the Mission San Gabriel, which is about 25 miles from CMC, um, about a week and a half ago, uh, portions of it burned to the ground because uh, perhaps it was due to a protest. Uh, so I think the investigation is still ongoing. But we can see that, that uh, there's a possibility that protests are being waged against those missions as sites of slavery as well. So it's something that we've all been kind of having to deal with lately. And for those of you who have joined um, CMC's student-led anti-racism book club this summer, um, you've also probably read Stamp from the Beginning, which discusses the ways that key figures in US history have either addressed race or promoted racist ideas. And again, those were oftentimes connected very strongly to the issues of slavery. And so this is all really terrific, I think, and this is really important critical inquiry if we wanna understand the deep history of race in the United States and the ways in which slavery created a foundation um, for racial thinking and oppression here. But one thing I think that's often kind of left out of these discussions is what enslaved people themselves actually experienced. Um, I think if you're raised in the US, you probably have a few people in mind when you think about uh, individuals who were enslaved. So Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, um, Dred Scott, maybe some of you even know about Nat Turner or Sally Hemings. Um, but these are individuals who were sort of known because their lives were sort of exceptional. Many of them became famous because they were able to escape slavery. But the vast majority of enslaved people lived lives that are very hard to recover, and it's hard to know exactly what their lives were like. And so I want to kind of spend today to discuss what were sort of the big issues that affected enslaved people and try to uh, highlight a few individual stories which might shed a little bit of light um, on them as well. So I want to start with a couple of quick um, and maybe broad uh, discussions to kind of get us thinking about this. And the first thing to acknowledge is just the challenge of having to study people who um, are oftentimes buried in the records and who don't have a lot of people speaking on their behalf. Um, now, if you're interested in anything that happened prior to 1900, it's really hard to study anyone who is not an elite individual. And it's also a challenge to study anyone who wasn't male. And um, I'm just gonna share my screen real quickly to put up a few things that maybe will help uh, to kind of explain this a little bit. So give me one second to do that. Um, so when we're talking about the sort of the challenge of, of looking at individuals who are not elites, it's not just this issue of history being written by the winners. That's kind of that old adage that history is that that's written by the winners. That is certainly an issue, but it's also that history is collected by the winners and history is usually retold by the winners as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think there, it's important to kind of acknowledge that the elite and literate and most prosperous uh, not only have the advantage to record their thoughts on the history that they lived through, uh, but the librarians and the re record keepers whose job it was to preserve those sources tended to value the thoughts of winners as well. So the very documents that might tell us something about the experiences of those who were in power don't actually survive into the present and make it that much harder to study those who were marginalized. So as an example, when the Library of Congress was founded in 1800, the librarians who were, uh, started to work there were far more likely to want to save a letter by George Washington than a letter by someone who he enslaved. So if the documents aren't saved, then it makes it that much more difficult for historians in the future to even know what those experiences were like. And on that final point I have on the screen, um, the privileges that someone like myself have to be able to make it through graduate school and be able to become employed in a university makes it far less likely that I'll be cognizant of the types of stories that have been told about the past. So all of that creates this issue where sometimes as historians, we kind of tell the same stories over and over about the same types of people. And that's especially true when we're talking about slavery. So it's really incumbent upon us as historians to try to find more stories beyond just those who are the most famous to us. The second thing that becomes a challenge with all this is that the records that come, that, that, that we have about enslaved people come from individuals who had the most contact with the enslaved but they were the least likely to believe that the enslaved were important enough to write about them, at least to write about them in any kind of way beyond just what they were producing. Um, slave owners did discuss enslaved workers. They discussed them in their letters and their diary entries. Um, they discussed them in account ledgers, but the vast majority of those discussions were really about their work. Slavery was an economic institution and it was there to make money. And because enslaved people were classified as property, their owners often didn't care to comment on the aspects of their lives that didn't involve some aspect of profit or gain. 
The flip side of that, though, is that because slavery was so profitable and because it was treated as a business and a profession, um, owners had to keep close records of what their enslaved people did. And enslaved people themselves could sometimes leave their own records about their lives, or they could disobey ma their masters, which would put them into the legal system, which also had a lot of records. So we aren't devoid of sources about enslaved people. We just have to be really vigilant about pulling out as much information as possible from the records that we do have. So I want to talk about um, sort of the major issues that enslaved people face in their lives. And then, as I mentioned, kind of get into some individual discussions to highlight few people who you might not have heard about, but who give us some sense about what that experience might have been like. So one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the term slavery is a pretty big one, and it's hard to really narrow it down to one exact thing. I think if you were raised in the US and you're asked to, to kind of explain what comes to mind when you hear the term slavery, most people would probably picture something like an African American harvesting cotton in Mississippi in the 1840s. That's kind of the version of slavery, at least in the US, that is oftentimes kind of directed at us. Um, but that's one version of slavery, but it's not the only one. Um, as I mentioned, it was first and foremost an economic system of labor exploitation. Um, you don't need racism to have slavery. Um, you don't need to have lifelong servitude to have slavery. And you don't even need violent brutality to have slavery. Every system of slavery from the ancient world up to the present had vastly different characteristics. But we can still limit our focus, and if we talk just about what's now the United States, there were still pretty big uh, discrepancies between the different regions that employed enslaved workers. Um, not only that, slavery as an institution was incredibly dynamic. It changed all the time. Um, it wasn't just this singular thing that was fixed and never changing. Um, the late Ira Berlin, who was a very important scholar on slavery in uh, uh, the 1980s, published a very seminal article in which he said there were two key variables when we're thinking about slavery and how to understand it. Um, the first is space. So what's the area that we're talking about? Um, slavery in Massachusetts was very different from slavery in Pennsylvania, which was very different from slavery in Virginia, which was very different from slavery in South Carolina. So what kinds of labor were enslaved people performing? Because that's really critical to understand what their day-to-day -day life was like. The second thing is time. And as historians, this is something we always think about. Um, what is the actual period of time that you're looking at? And as I'll discuss here in a little bit, slavery in the 1650s in Virginia was very different from slavery in the 1720s. And it was very different from the 1790s, even though it's in that same location. So time and space are really sort of the critical variables um, to think about. And um, historians have really built upon that idea in the last several decades. People like Philip Morgan and Alec Kulikoff have kind of uh, pushed that theory out into more detail. So for the purpose of this talk, I just want to focus on two particular regions. I want to look at South Carolina and I want to look at Virginia to first interrogate this issue of space. Um, Dan, and as I mentioned- Dan, sorry to interrupt. Oh, there, sorry. Your microphone's going in and out at times. I'm not sure if it's hitting your shirt or if, there, if it'd be better to just use the computer, but uh, you go quiet about every six or seven seconds just for, for a second. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Is this, let me see if I can, is it still, a little bit rough right now? Sounds good right now. Okay, uh, maybe I'm speaking too quickly. I'm sorry, that could be an issue too. Um, but thanks for letting me know. I'll, I'll try to, if I slow it down, maybe that will help a little bit. So I'm sorry for those of you that have been hearing me breaking it out. Um, so let me just kind of take a step back and, and talk about two locations, which might give us some sense about what slavery was like. So let's look first at South Carolina. And what I wanna argue is that the type of crop that enslaved people had to work was absolutely fundamental to what their life was like. So for South Carolina, the major crop was rice. And this dictated so much of what um, it was like to be an enslaved person if you had to farm rice. So let's just talk about what the characteristics of rice were and then how that affected individuals that had to farm it. Well, first off, it has a very long growing season. You have to sort of maintain those, those um, rice paddies for a, a good deal of the year. And you have to maintain them in stagnant water. So rice is grown in water, and so those are the kind of conditions which you have to have for rice farming. Second, it's easily farmed, and by that I don't mean that it was, it was uh, not hard on the body, it was very hard on the body, but it was not something that needed a tremendous amount of skill to farm. It was sort of planting it, it was weeding it, it was just kind of making sure that everything was, was uh, working properly. So there was not a lot of need for close supervision. 
The third thing is that rice doesn't exhaust the soil because water is constantly bringing in uh, new uh, nutrients. Um, a plantation could be in the same spot for many, many generations and still be as productive uh, in 1800 as it had been in 1700. So that's a really important characteristic of rice. And then a final thing, which isn't necessarily all that critical for rice, but it was something that's critical for this whole uh, issue, is that it had been farmed in Africa um, before people came, were brought over against their will um, to North America. So let's talk about how those various characteristics actually shaped enslaved life. And Evan, just wanna make sure, is the microphone doing better now? It's mostly doing better. It cuts out occasionally. It does, you don't cut out completely. It just goes quieter. Okay. So I don't know if it's, it might be hitting your shirt or something, but it, it hasn't happened as much as it was. Okay. Well, I, again, I apologize for this. This is part of the, you know, online learning it can be tough sometimes, right? But we'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> so let's talk about the long growing season um, issue and the, the issue of it being grown in stagnant water. So the long growing season meant that this was a very, very difficult crop to farm. It was backbreaking work. It was unhealthy on people's bodies. And because it was in stagnant water, not only was rice growing, but mosquitoes were breeding in those, those swampy areas. And so because of that, we have a much bigger cases of yellow fever and malaria being sort of circulated within the enslaved population. So many more people died than in other locations in North America. Now, that means that we have more frequent run people running away. There's a strong correlation between how difficult someone's task is and particularly when their particular work regime becomes at its most stress point, that's when we see the most number of people running away. And that makes sense, right? So we see more people running away in South Carolina than say Virginia. The mortality rate is also really important because um, uh, uh, planters in South Carolina had to import more Africans into their plantations in order to maintain the population of their enslaved workforce. So that's important because there was a constant influx of African culture into that society. And I'll talk about that in just a second. What about that issue about the less need for close supervision? Well, that was important because for rice growing, whites could really just send enslaved workers out into the field and not have to supervise them. They would come by at the end of the day to make sure that their work had been done, but they didn't need to make sure that they were doing everything in a close, important way. So that actually created really distant relationships between whites and enslaved people. And so we see in South Carolina, there was a much, uh, uh, it took much longer for enslaved people to adopt English, to adopt uh, European customs of any form, and even to adopt Christianity. Um, it was much more influenced by African uh, uh, tradition and culture. And there's some legacy of that still today. If you go to South Carolina, especially to the Sea Islands, um, sometimes in Charleston, you can see the Gullah people. And the Gullah people, uh, Clarence Thomas, one of our Supreme Court justices, he's actually Gullah. Um, the Gullah uh, speak a language which is a hybrid of kind of African and English languages. And it's really a legacy of that more distance relationship to whites in South Carolina. That third point about the exhaustion of the soil, because plantations were not moving very readily, we have much more fixed family units. Multiple generations would survive on a plantation in South Carolina. And so there's much, very, very strong family networks on those plantations. And then finally, on the issue of rice being farmed in Africa, um, enslaved expertise was absolutely critical in creating the plantations um, in that society. And there was in fact a greater retention of African culture because of that, because individuals were allowed to or could use their expertise in that crop. Now, if we compare that to Virginia, Virginia had a different cash crop. Uh, tobacco for most of the 18th century was the dominant crop. And that's what most enslaved people uh, farmed in that period of time. Tobacco has its own characteristics. It's a much more demanding crop. It needs a lot of close supervision. You have to plant it at the right time. You have to weed it properly. You have to kind of cultivate it in its growth in a specific way. You have to cut it at the right time and you have to dry it in the proper way. So a lot of supervision is needed. However, it has a relatively short growing season compared to rice. So it doesn't have uh, quite as much time spent in the fields as rice. At the same time though, tobacco is a really nutrient heavy and demanding crop. So it really exhausts the soil. So what you see is either plantations having to move every couple of generations 
or they're having to change what types of crops they're farming, which results in people being sold, enslaved people being sold off to try to recalibrate that farming system. And then finally, Virginia was a healthier climate and tobacco was grown in drier fields. So how does that affect enslaved life? Just those kind of basic characteristics of tobacco. Well, because of that need for close supervision, there were actually much closer relationships with whites. And so uh, Virginia's enslaved population tends to adopt certain aspects of white culture much more readily. They spoke English much earlier than those in South Carolina. They adopted Christianity much uh, sooner. And they even took on certain um, European family formations. Many of the West African societies that people came from had a tolerance for polygamous relationships. Because the slave trade valued male over female workers though, they could not recreate that aspect of polygamy in the new world. And so those enslaved workers had to adopt much more so to, um, the, to the, the standards of European culture. What about the relatively short growing season? Well, because in a relative speaking, there was a little bit less demanding in terms of what their, their year long work regime was like, there were fewer rebellions and fewer people running away in Virginia than there were in South Carolina. Again, people ran away when they were at their most stressed point. And because there was a little bit more of a reprieve in the winter time, fewer enslaved people ran away. What about that issue of exhausting the soil? Well, that regular movement of plantations or the selling off of enslaved people created tremendous havoc for enslaved families. Um, mothers, fathers, children, grandparents were sold off frequently and it created massive ruptures in enslaved family life. And so we see much more displaced families and much more trauma within the families in Virginia. And then finally, on the issue of a healthier climate, uh, this reduced the mortality for Virginia's enslaved population. So Virginians actually didn't need to import Africans to the same degree. In fact, by 1750, Virginia basically stopped importing Africans. And in 1774, Virginia tried to abolish the slave trade, not because of a humanitarian impulse, but because they just didn't need to import any more Africans in, and they thought it would raise the price of the enslaved workers that they had. This also meant that there was sort of a reduced African cultural influence um, because of that. Um, just in the interest of time, I think I might skip, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the evolution of black society, and that gets at that issue of time. And I, I realize that my own time is starting to get a little bit limited here, so I don't wanna go into too much detail here. But I just put up this slide to kind of give you a sense of of how time actually did influence um, enslaved life. So you have in the early period a slow assimilation to white norms, um, a, a massive disruption in uh, disruption, I should say, in, in enslaved culture in the early 18th century because many Africans were brought over. And then as that African slave trade kind of stopped with natural reproduction beginning in Virginia households, we see a decrease in the influence of African culture. So. This creates, uh, by 1790, um, uh, a very, um, what, what, what white Virginians believe to be a very assimilated enslaved population. And that's gonna be important for the rest of our discussion. And I'll just kind of leave that slide for just a second, just so you have a sense to look over it. So let's get into the issue of what individuals had to face um, within all of this. So we have kind of the background to how enslaved people what their lives were like and how they were shaped. But I wanna talk about individual stories too to just give some sense about what this was like. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that white Virginians interpreted the supposed assimilation of their enslaved population. They interpreted that as compliance and they believed that their enslaved population were the most loyal and the most loving to their masters amongst all those groups in North America. And there was a real belief that their slaves loved them. And this belief would endure well past the Civil War as white Virginians tried to defend the history of slavery as being a benevolent institution and one that enslaved people actually enjoyed. And to some degree, that hasn't fully left um, certain pockets of the nation. But Virginia really experienced two big challenges to that notion of compliance in the 19th century. Uh, the first was in 1800 when a man named Gabriel Prosser, who was an enslaved man in Southampton, Virginia, um, he was found to have concocted an uprising. It was a conspiracy that was discovered before it could be carried out. Um, but he and 25 conspirators were executed and Virginia immediately began to, to put into place a number of laws against free blacks and enslaved individuals uh, to try to limit the possibility of that happening again. And it created a real sense of fear in white society at the time. Um, this would happen again in 1831 
with a, an actual insurrection which took place by a man named Nat Turner. Um, and Nat, Matt, Nat Turner uh, was able to convince a number of enslaved individuals to rise up along with him. And they killed several dozen white people before they were eventually uh, caught, um, they were executed. And it created, again, a real sense of terror in Virginia. And what we see is that Virginians who had been kind of wavering on the issue of emancipation, and a number of Virginians had actually floated the idea of gradual emancipation, when that Turner's rebe rebellion uh, uh, carries out, um, that immediately shuts down that dis uh, discussion. And suddenly the idea of emancipation is no longer discussed in Virginia. So the compliance issue or the sense of assimilation that white Virginians thought they were witnessing was really one largely only done in self-preservation. And it was a way that enslaved people could try to navigate the oppression that they had to face within their households. And even if enslaved Virginians didn't rise up, because not all enslaved people wanted to rise up and revolt, they didn't want to risk their lives necessarily, they had other ways of resisting. So I want to just put up this slide really quickly of a house probably a lot of you are familiar with. This is Monticello. This is Thomas Jefferson's house. And uh, you know, Monticello is really seen as kind of an early triumph of American architecture. And Jefferson is really given a lot of credit for the amount of influence that he had over his construction. But as you might imagine, for a plantation house in the South, uh, it was largely built by enslaved people. And the person who carved uh, the Doric columns on the front of Monticello was a man named Jupiter. And Jupiter was an enslaved man who was born the exact same year as Thomas Jefferson, who was born on Jefferson's father's plantation called Shadwell. And Jupiter and Jefferson grew up together. They were childhood friends. They played together as boys. And from later correspondence, it's clear that Jefferson had a huge amount of uh, affection for him. He called him his trusty servant. In fact, when Jefferson was 21, Jupiter became his valet. He basically attended him day and night. And he stayed in that position for 10 years until he was replaced by a man named Robert Hemings, who some of you might know was the brother of Sally Hemings, who was the woman that Jefferson had a long-term sexual relationship with. Um, when Jupiter was replaced as valet, he took over the stables on Jefferson's estate. And he eventually taught himself how to cut stone. He was able to kind of advance himself um, within the enslaved community by taking on the initiative of learning different trades. And Jefferson would use that, that talent and that ability to cut stone when he started to construct Monticello. So we have Jupiter, or we have information about Jupiter's life because of two particular sources. Uh, one is Thomas Jefferson's papers where he discusses his enslaved workers um, and he discusses their with his overseers. And the other sources come from his family. Uh, his family wrote a lot of memoirs in the 19th century because people were just so interested in Thomas Jefferson in that period of time. And they would discuss these kind of trusty old servants that they had. And so we get a fair amount of family lore about some of these individuals. Um, there's an interesting story from one of Jefferson's grandchildren where he was talking about Jupiter. And this grandchild said that um, the, the worst argument they had ever seen Thomas Jefferson engage in was actually an argument with Jupiter. Uh, and the story behind that was that Jefferson had wanted to um, have two young enslaved boys take a horse to the post office to deliver a letter. And Jupiter, who was in charge of the horses in the plantation, refused because he thought the boys were too young. They didn't know how to handle the horses. And so he, he basically refused Jefferson. And Jefferson became livid with uh, uh, sort of the fact that Jupiter was going to, to dismiss his ideas in front of other enslaved people. Um, it wasn't that Jupiter was incorrect, but it was that he had challenged his authority. And so it's clear from that moment that Jefferson held pretty strict lines of authority, even for those he had grown up with uh, as a child. Um, now, Jupiter also was kind of tasked with lots of uh, physically difficult and menial jobs. He collected eggs for Jefferson at one point. Um, he was delivering le letters to neighbors. He was tasked with this really difficult challenge of building a canal on the property. So even though he was considered a privileged slave on uh, the plantation, um, he still had a really difficult life. Um, there are no records in Jefferson's letters of Jefferson uh, instituting any kind of physical punishment against Jupiter, but he does institute certain other punishments. In one case, he forced him to take a long journey to pick up something, which was several days, uh, because he let a mule escape. And so there were some punishments that were meted out, even if it wasn't necessarily physical. Much worse than this though, um, Jefferson actually gave Jupiter's wife and their child to his daughter as a wedding present. Um, this was something that happened all the time. Families were separated because as considered property in that system, um, individuals could be given away as gifts, they could be given away to pay off debts, 
And this was the case in, in Jupiter's uh, life. His wife and child were given to Jefferson's daughter. Um, this created tremendous anguish, as you might imagine, about family being separated. Ultimately, Jupiter was able to convince Jefferson to keep the family together, um, but it made that possibility of separation ever present uh, for the rest of his life. So for Jupiter and for many others in Virginia, this concern about selling off of enslaved relatives was constant and it was a horrendous event that, that occurred many, many times over for lots and lots of people, especially in Virginia. So Jupiter's experiences weren't unusual for a domestic servant in slavery. Um, like a lot of people in the 18th century in Virginia, he was highly integrated into the colonial system and he was fully cognizant of the white community that he was forced to serve. Um, he retained a great deal of connection to Jefferson, to the man who claimed ownership over him. Um, and he was virtually powerless to stop that man from dividing up his family. At the same time, though, Jupiter appears to have retained some sense of independence and autonomy. He not only learned his own trade, but as I mentioned, he was able to confront Jefferson when he thought he was out of line. So there's ways in which small aspects of resistance um, could be kind of uh, uh, put out by enslaved. Um, Jupiter had some advantages considering his close relationship with Jefferson, um, but when those ties didn't exist, masters were far more likely to punish and to punish pretty severely. And the litany of abuses that enslaved people had to face are far too long to discuss here, and you're probably familiar with a lot of them. And they populate nearly every page of plantation account books and ledgers that we have. What's remarkable about planners' correspondence, though, is how liberally they would apply those punishments even to individuals whom they claim to have a strong affection for. Uh, so one particularly galling example comes from a man named Richard Epps. Um, and I can just stop my screen sharing here. Sorry, I realize you've been staring at that picture of Monticello for a long time. Um, Epps considered himself to be a benevolent slave owner, uh, but he also convinced himself that it was his duty to reprimand enslaved people. Uh, he fought for their own good. And he had a diary that contained numerous accounts of enslaved people being whipped, subdued, having food taken away, having health care denied, and other means of breaking their will. And he also recognized the effect that these measures had on the whole community when it was done. Um, there's a, a sort of horrendous case of this, which happened two years before the outbreak of the Civil War, in which he whipped a 70-year-old woman named Jenny uh, because she let her chickens run loose from their coop. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but Epps used this as a way of kind of showing his authority over the whole community. And in his diary, he actually wrote that he uh, lashed her, quote, as mildly as possible, more for effect on the others than to hurt her, end quote. And this really says much more about Epps than it does about Jenny. It shows how punishment was a form of community surveillance. And it also shows how close the enslaved community was, considering that Epps thought it would be a valuable lesson to harm a, uh, an elderly woman in a public fashion. So this kind of goes along as much as we have cases of Jupiter who had this what, what his master thought was an affectionate relationship. We have these very kind of violent relationships as well. Let me just get into two other sources and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. And again, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just giving you a lot of snapshots here and I'm more than happy to talk about any aspects of, uh, of slavery that you want to talk about. Um, one of the things that is important to know is that we do sometimes have letters and memoirs from enslaved people. There were a large number of slave autobiographies which were published in the 1840s and the 1850s, which documented just how horrible that institution was. And if you haven't already done so, I'd really advise reading uh, the narratives of, of Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass, Solomon Northup, uh, William Box Brown. All of them give really focused and damning critiques of what life was like under slavery. Um, Douglass and Northup spend a lot of time talking about the sort of physical violence that they faced. Um, Harriet Jacobs discusses the sexual violence that she had to endure, and Henry Box Brown goes into a lot of detail about sort of the challenges of just maintaining a family in slavery. Um, so these autobiographies are some of the best ways to look at the realities uh, that people in slavery faced. But we do sometimes have letters from enslaved people themselves, and interestingly, one of Thomas Jefferson's really good friends, uh, a man named uh, John Hartwell Cock, uh, Cock had actually helped Jefferson to found the University of Virginia, and they wrote quite a bit to, to one another. And Cock was much more uneasy with slavery than Jefferson was, and he in fact kind of instituted some policies of gradual emancipation for his slaves. Um, he also uh, tried to educate some of his enslaved workers to read and write, and he freed several of them who he actually paid for their passage to go to Liberia. This was the Skipwith family, and the Skipwith family um, went to Liberia as part of 
what we would now call a pretty racist scheme to try to get rid of free blacks from the United States. Uh, but for many people who had just won their freedom, they thought that perhaps Africa would be a better alternative to the racism of the United States. So we have letters from these free Skipwiths who wrote back from Africa to Virginia just to kind of maintain their family connections with people on the plantation back in Virginia. And there are kind of three things that stand out in those letters. The first is that there was really a, a strong and expansive notion of what family was like within the enslaved community. So the Skipwith letters contain numerous requests to acknowledge aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, um, and even requests for presents to be given to them. So uh, family was really the most discussed part of those letters. And so we see just how critical that was, um, not only for the community, but also for individuals to feel um, uh, rooted back to uh, the people around them. The second important issue was uh, how dominant religion was in the early 19th century for the enslaved community in Virginia. So Christianity was a major part of their letters. There was frequent reference to Jesus, to the Bible, um, to the church. Um, and this would have been sort of radically different from South Carolina at that same moment in time. Uh, enslaved people in South Carolina were just starting to convert in large numbers in the early 19th century. But for Virginia, there was a much more stable and much more kind of enduring connection to Christianity by the early 19th century. And then the final thing that these letters show is um, the ways in which uh, uh, the enslaved community could engage in a bit of coaching and how to navigate relationships with white owners. So many of the letters that were written by the Skipwiths back to family in Virginia were actually written to the owners because the owners could then read to those who were illiterate and pass along information. And because of this, uh, the letters contain a great deal of flattery of the owners and of the white people in that household. And they sort of give some cues to their enslaved recipients to be mindful of engaging in such flattery themselves. Um, so they really appear to be kind of brilliant forms of soft resistance in order to retain, if not expand, some of the privileges uh, that those individuals receive. Let me give one final example and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up and see what questions you have. Um, one other way that we can actually delve into some of the particularities of enslaved life is through court records. So masters were not given full jurisdiction over their enslaved workers. Um, if enslaved people broke the law, if they damaged someone else's property, if they hurt someone off their plantation, then the state could actually intervene. And Virginia's uh, county court records contain a large number of these cases involving enslaved people. And they give us a little bit of a window into their lives, even though they're rife with biases and false accusations. And they're, they're problematic in certain ways, but they actually give us some interesting information as well. So last year when I was going through the Library of Virginia Records, I found kind of an interesting case in 1817 of a 98-year-old enslaved man named Old Matt. And Old Matt was brought before the Cumberland County Court. And he was brought there because there had been a spate of poisonings in the region in the, the months before that in which a number of white people had died, including a couple of families who had all been poisoned. And authorities arrested old Matt because he was known to be a medicine man. And it's unclear if they had any evidence uh, against him. The court records don't go into much detail on that. But he was charged with having made a poison and having given it to another enslaved man who went on to kill his master. Um, so when old Matt was asked to testify, he, I think he probably likely knew he was not going to escape with his life. But he chose an interesting strategy, though, to defend himself, and if not to defend the man who was, who was uh, charged with having taken that poison and administered it to his master. Um, old Matt confessed that he did make a potion and that he gave it to the man who then used it on his master. Um, but Matt claimed that it wasn't a poison. He said it was a potion to, quote, make his masters and mistresses love him, end quote. So this was actually a concoction which was meant, he claimed, to have his masters become more uh, um, affectionate towards their enslaved people. Um, he said, unfortunately, the potion didn't work and it ultimately killed the family. And what's really fascinating to me about this confession is that it showed how enslaved people recognized the fantasy the white Virginians had about slavery. Um, whites had tried to convince themselves that their slaves adored them and that they didn't feel abused under the system. And Matt's claim was that he was acting only to make sure that that love was returned. Um, it was a pretty bold claim. Uh, it was one that probably filled certain people's uh, hearts with glee in the audience. It ultimately didn't work. The judge uh, sentenced him to be hanged. But it gets at sort of the ways in which uh, enslaved people try to navigate around those issues, those issues uh, of racism 
and also kind of paternalism, which was so dominant in that period of time. So just to kind of wrap up, these are, these are just kind of a handful of stories. I hope they inspire you to look a little bit more deeply into the history of slavery. And as I mentioned at the start of the talk, it, it really is critical to investigate the role that slavery played as an institution, because economically and institutionally, it had such a huge impact on the United States and continues to have an impact in terms of its legacy. And it's probably one of the most important ways to understand how issues of racism and systematic racism work in the US today. But it's also critical to remember that slavery was experienced by human beings and that they have a story too. And their stories aren't always completely captured by the most famous ones that we were taught in school but they're nevertheless still important. So I hope that you can start exploring those stories yourself. Um, but in the meantime, I'm more than happy to take any questions you might have. So thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Livesey. Really appreciate um, your comments, your slides, and your time today. A number of questions have come through the text, so I'm happy to um, ask those on everyone's behalf. Some of them even overlapped. Um, um, question about, um, um, kind of what, what are the best sources of personal accounts from, from slaves? You mentioned that history is written by and shared by the winners. Um, so what are the best sources of personal accounts from slaves? That, that's great. Um, there's there's a, a slave um, autobiography anthology, which you, if you just um, even go on Amazon and do slave biography anthology, you'll find a multi-volume set which has not only the kind of the big hits, people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs and Solomon Northup, but there are dozens and dozens of other accounts from enslaved people. Um, there was kind of an industry in the 1850s um, of publishing accounts from the people who had run away from slavery and anti-slavery activists used those accounts to try to win people over to the abolitionist cause. So the, the descriptions that enslaved people told of their own experience were actually fundamental to the transformation of public opinion. And it also gives us some really, really deep context to understand what life in slavery was like. Um, so I would say that those are probably some of the kind of key sources um, to look into is um, those sort of slave anthologies. Um, there, there's, there's just a lot, I think, in terms of what historians have written about it. Um, David Blight has a new book, or this is a couple years old now, about Frederick Douglass, which gives a lot of context to that as well. And so if you're wanting a kind of a, a more of a, a broad look at slave life, I would recommend David Blight's examination of Frederick Douglass. But that's sort of where I would start if you want to learn more about that enslaved experience. Thank you. And a good follow-up uh, question from Brad Pine. Does the lack of first-person voices describing the experience of enslaved people make it harder for us to understand the intense impact of slavery on our country? Does yeah, that's a great... harder to appropriately address the issue and its vestiges today? Yeah, sorry for jumping in there. That's a great question, too. And, and one of the issues that historians have to confront right now is how do we read those sources? So to, to kind of go back just a second, if we look at the autobiographies that are published in the 1840s and the 1850s uh, from enslaved people's perspectives. Um, those can be kind of problematic in their own way too, because oftentimes white authors could revise them, they could try to make them more standard, more formulaic. So we have to be careful not to treat them as 100% accurate. There could be, there are certain issues with those, those sources. And of course, when we're dealing with plantation accounts or we're dealing with you know, slave owners who are writing about enslaved workers, they're coming at it from a very, very obviously biased and prejudicial perspective. And so, you know, one of the things historians say is that you try to read against the grain when you're reading a biased source. And what that means is that you try to actually pull yourself away from that first person perspective and say, well, what might be the reason why we'd be talking about a person in this way? So we're constantly having as historians to take a step back, not take any of these things at face value and to try to accumulate as many sources as possible in order to figure out what kinds of threads stand out. So it's always a, a challenge. And it's not just a challenge for people that study slavery. It's a challenge for people who study uh, women in history because there's a tremendous amount of bias against women in sources from that same period of time. Um, there, there's all sorts of biases against all other types of marginalized communities. So it's something that is, is a big challenge. What's nice though is that we do have Again, letters where people can speak for themselves, um, enslaved people. We do have those autobiographies. 
Um, I did a little short thing for the YAF recently where I talked about uh, the WPA records, and this might be something that some of you might know about, um, but we have this fantastic treasure trove of sources that were written in the 1930s. And what happened was that um, during the Great Depression, uh, the Work Progress Administration hired um, hundreds of people to go around, travel door to door in black communities in the South, and to try to find people who had been enslaved. Now those people by the 1930s, they were in their 80s and their 90s and some were in their hundreds. And they just sat down and they said, what was it like to be enslaved? And these people would tell their stories. And if you go to the Library of Congress and you just type in slave autobiographies, um, you can actually read through tens of thousands of pages of testimony from uh, people who had been, you know, children and teenagers in slavery. So we do have firsthand accounts, but even with the WPA narratives, there's, there's certain challenges with those too. Obviously some people were not comfortable talking to a random person who wants to know about slavery in the Jim Crow South. So everything has, you know, a grain of salt attached to it, but, um, but we do have some sources that can kind of help us understand that. But to get back to the original question, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a massive challenge. And I think we're always trying to find as many new sources as we can in order to at least get somewhat closer to that experience. Um, again, a, a short follow-up that comes from Jen. Um, how can recovering silent voices of the past help us with our current political climate? Yeah, I, I think one thing that might be evident from this issue around the Confederate monuments is this issue around what do we do with the past and how do we, how do we interpret the past? And the issue around Confederate monuments is very challenging, especially, you know, if you've ever lived in the South, you know how, how kind of hot button that issue is. And for certain parts of the population, they, they see it as heritage. And for some people that's coded language and for some people it's not coded language and they really believe that this is a way of erasing the past. But I think when you recover silence voices and when you talk about what the experience of slavery is, you see just the big division between the celebration of people who were there to defend slavery and the experiences of people who actually had to endure slavery. So one of the things I just talked about you know, just a few minutes ago was the ways in which this idea that slavery was not that bad, that slaves actually enjoyed their, their lives, that there was a, a strong bond between master and slave. Um, that didn't really go away for a long period of time. And especially during Reconstruction and the early Jim Crow era, even to some extent that narrative survives today with uh, um, sort of this idea of kind of the paternal uh, um, antebellum plantation. Th that really was a way of trying to paper over the history of slavery. It was a way of trying to diminish its impact. And it was a way of trying to marginalize the people who fought so strongly against it. So I think recovering those voices can kind of help to point to the systematic oppression that people experience and why we need to recognize that and why we need to think about how we commemorate our history and how we commemorate our history. So it gives some more context, I think, to especially the issues around statues and the, the issue around commemoration in general. Um, we have someone who's, who's traveled to Brazil recently on the call or on se several occasions um, and seen the strong retention of African culture and dress that still exists there today. Uh, you indicated that South Carolina maintained more of African culture than other parts of the U.S. Why do you think that there wasn't as strong of a sense of African culture retained here that was true in other places such as Brazil? Great question. Um, so Brazil is, uh, is a sort of fascinating place. If you look at the slave trade, which, you know, starts effectively from 1500, goes to 1888, um, about 4% of all Africans who were taken across the Atlantic end up in what's now the United States. So if you're raised in the US, you tend to think that the African slave trade is a US story. And relatively speaking, it's not at all. Only 4% of the 12 million people who were brought across the Atlantic came to what's now the United States. 45%, so about 5 million Africans were taken to Brazil. Brazil was uh, a, a massive sugar plantation and it made tremendous amounts of money for the Portuguese and Brazil had a constant influx of Africans all throughout its history and it wasn't until 1888 that the slave trade was abolished in Brazil officially abolished kind of you know there had been laws that had claimed it was illegal but they were they were circumvented 
So because of that, Brazil is always, um, throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, is always having this influx of African influence. And so in a lot of ways, that's so central for why African culture, even African elements of African language are still so dominant in Brazil. For you know, Virginia and you know, Maryland and North Carolina, even to some extent South Carolina, because the slave trade is not as dominant, and that's not because slavery is less important in the United States, it's simply that natural reproduction in the enslaved population in the United States prevents the need for more Africans to be imported. Because of that, you get this kind of cutoff of African influence um, really at the end of the 18th century. And so it creates a kind of Creole society which is almost forced to have to adapt to white society or white norms. At the same time, white society adopts some aspect of African culture. So it's not as if it's a one-way street. African culture has an influence on white society in the South as well. So you know, if you think about the, the white pa the patio on a plantation, the patio is an African invention, at least the way that the white Southerners develop their patios. So um, a lot of the cooking in Southern cuisine comes from African culture. So there's ways in which it's a two-way street. But um, I think because that African influence was shut down so much earlier for the United States, uh, it, it reduces some of the prevalence of African culture uh, here. And a brief follow-up to that, what book do you think best capitalizes on the evolution of Black society in America? Well, that's a good question. I, the, you know, for those of you that read Stan from the beginning, it's a great primer just in sort of the history of racism. I mean, it's chock full of information. I was, I was impressed with our students that were able to read it because there's a lot going on there. Um, so that gives you some sense of the idea of racism and how it evolved. I think one of the books, which is, it's a little bit long, but it really does a great job of going through um, kind of this argument that I laid out about, especially in terms of uh, the difference between Virginia and South Carolina and the ways that enslaved culture transformed and moved over time. It's a book called Slave Counterpoint by a man named Philip Morgan. Philip Morgan teaches at Johns Hopkins and he wrote Slave Counterpoint about 22 years ago. But it's a really fantastic exploration of how enslaved communities developed on plantations, um, what sort of forces they had to face, and how they were able to adapt and to build communities in light of that um, those transformations. Great, thank you. We're going to go to Midori and then Art uh, and then end with a question from Mark Schwartz. So um, Midori, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Midori was able to kind of merge a couple of questions together. So go ahead. Hi, thanks, um, Professor. Um, just as a CMC history alum myself and then now a history teacher for high schoolers, um, I was just looking through the questions in the chat and, and um, wanted to bring attention to Mr. Baker's question um, about this concept of white slavery in the U.S. with Irish immigrants. And I was hoping that maybe you could articulate the uh, distinction between indentured servitude and chattel slavery, um, as well as maybe expand a little bit um, on, on race and, and why, you know, what legacy um, chattel slavery has had in this country in terms of a highly racialized and um, oppressive formation of institutions? That's a great question. And it's one that I think is absolutely critical to understand um, why American slavery needs to be considered along with the issue of race and why race is so critical for it. So um, absolutely, there was oppression being meted out on white people who came over. So indentured servitude was a big part of the labor pool, especially in early Virginia. And there were thousands and thousands of people in, in Britain who came over. They had very difficult lives in Britain. They basically sold their labor for usually about a seven year period with the promise of being taken across the Atlantic. And after the end of that indenture to get a little bit of land they could farm on their own. Um, and they had pretty difficult lives when they were indentured servants. And there's, there's certainly an argument that it, there's elements of slavery within that. But one of the things that you find when you look at not only experiences of indentured servants compared to Africans, especially in Virginia in the middle of the 17th century, is that Africans are much more often put into lifelong servitude. So sometimes they are given indentured servants um, or indentured servant contracts, but by and large, they tend to have much more, much longer periods of servitude. Um, they're also punished much more strongly and much more directly. 
And starting in the 1660s, the law in Virginia especially begins to explicitly conflate Africans with slaves in a way that it doesn't with whites. So historians still debate this a little bit that say the 1630s, 1640s, perhaps racism isn't quite as strong as you might imagine. And part of that is people just don't really, I mean, racism is a social construct, right? So they don't really have a firm sense of, of what the differences between people are. Um, but by the 1660s, the law is absolutely distinguishing between Africans and Europeans in terms of indentured servitude. And the laws are much more strict against Africans. And that begins the process where slowly servitude is, is absolutely synonymous with Africans and it's no longer synonymous with whites. Um, there's a much deeper history to that. And, and just a reference stamp from the beginning, which uh, I, I mentioned earlier, um, the early chapters actually go into some detail about that debate and that discussion. So that's a good way to talk about it. Um, and I think you had a second point about, could you just remind me what your second question was? I think you kind of actually got at it um, with how then race starts to become integrated in, in the formation of our institutions as exclusionary, um, which I think is the big issue that we all are, um, that have, has been tried to be brought to everybody's attention for many centuries and uh, most recently has been top of mind. Um, but yeah, that was great. I just wanted to make sure that personally I have a, an issue with the idea of white slavery and that's why I just wanted to make sure that there was um, some distinction that you could articulate on as the expert between endangered servitude and slavery. So thank you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for the question. All right, we're going to Art. Go ahead, Art. All right, Dan, thank you. So yeah, doesn't Gangs in New York, the film, touch about the Irish opportunity to join the Union Army? But my question is, I was in the nation's capital last time in 2014, and I was struck how at Williamsburg and Mount Vernon the narratives regarding the role of slave labor in the everyday endurance of life and the capital and the, and the things produced on those locations that was going on. Are you aware of any other institutions that are undergoing a narrative change and bringing slavery more to the forefront in their presentations? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I had a one month residency at Mount Vernon a couple of years ago, and I've been really impressed with the ways in which they're, they're dealing with the issue of, of slavery. In, to my mind, the leader in this is Monticello, and Monticello, I think, was sort of the first plantation to, to really come to terms with what was going on. For the longest time, it had not been great on those issues, and had denied the, issue, the relationship between Jefferson and Sally Hemings, um, but in part because of great leadership, especially from Annette Gordon-Reed, who is a fantastic scholar, African-American scholar at Harvard, who has studied Jefferson. Um, she's one of the, the kind of key figures in transforming that. Um, and and, and they, they just, I think, have, have um, been much more upfront with the legacy of slavery on, the, on that plantation and to not deny um, the fact that this was a site of oppression uh, on top of being a site of very thoughtful reflection on republicanism and on democracy. So those two things kind of coexist. But, um, but I think there's been a good trend uh, away from some of the glorification of the, the plantation, maybe say up until the 1970s. Um, I think Williamsburg has a long way to go. I lived in Williamsburg for two years and I think that they never really knew how to deal with the issue of slavery. Um, but I think that, that there's been a real um, change in tide, that the tide has kind of turned. And, and, um, but I, I would say that Monticello, to my mind, is the best plantation on that. Mm -hmm. So I do recognize it's 12.02. Uh, Professor Livesey said he would stay another 10 minutes or so, but if you have to uh, leave, feel free to do so. Our next question will be on reparations. Uh, a big thank you for myself and from the entire CNC community for all of your support over the last year. It's been trying with COVID-19, sending our students home in March. Um, and of course, our end of the year was uh, June 30. So to everyone who's volunteered, spread the word about CMC, and of course, contributed phil philanthropically, thank you for your continued support. We can't do all that we do uh, without you. Um, so continuing on, of course, if you have to sign off, feel free to do so. Um, do you think, Professor Livesey, there's a likelihood of the US government ever paying reparations to descendants of enslaved citizens? And if so, how do you think that would actually um, happen for legitimate claimants? 
That's a great question. I, I teach a history of slavery class every year. Um, this, this year, I've taught it in a, uh, a prison. Last year, I taught it at the CRC prison in Norco, California. We brought 12 Claremont College students into a prison to have class with 12 incarcerated students. And um, I'm doing it again this fall, though it's going to be over Zoom. But this will be the first Zoom classroom in a prison, I think, in the U.S. So it's pretty exciting. But I always talk about reparations at the end. It's always a, a complicated topic. And it's actually a topic I find, uh, I'm always surprised that people have varying responses to that across all different social spectrums. Um, I, I'm, historians are good at looking at the past and not good at looking at the future. I would say that if I had to guess, it doesn't seem likely that reparations would come about, but I could be wrong. I, um, I, some of you probably read Ta-Nehisi Coase's um, article from six years ago about reparations. And, and I think one of the things he advocates for is a, at least a study on what reparations could be like. And at the very least, that could be the start of that discussion. So I think that that would be my hope in the coming years is that at the very least, there could be a discussion about reparations. And who knows what the kind of form it could take. It could take the form of um, individual payments, it could take the form of uh, affirmative action, it could take the form of investments in communities. I think there's all sorts of ways that that could take place. I'm not terribly optimistic. Um, my other area of specialization on the topic of slavery is the Caribbean. And in the English speaking Caribbean, there's a big effort of reparations as well going on right now. And um, the likelihood of that is not very strong, but uh, there's, a, there's a demand for the British government to try to put investment back into the Caribbean, which uh, really had no investment up until uh, emancipation. So I'm not optimistic, but I'm, I'm hopeful that there could at least be a discussion going forward about reparations. Whitney asked if you could, um, if you could walk through cotton farming practices using the framework you shared uh, during the presentation. And Whitney is on if, if you need any clarification on that question. Sure, Whitney, did you wanna to say anything more? Or? No, that's, that's about it. Um, I, 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 I'm guessing that it might be similar to, to tobacco, but I'm curious if there are any other distinctions. Yeah, um, it's a pretty brutal type of, of farming. So it's actually, uh, I believe the growing season is a little bit longer than tobacco. It's, it's mm -hmm. a little bit more labor intensive. As you know, cotton picking, if you've ever seen a cotton plant, it's thorny, it's tough, it's really hard to get cotton off of the bales. Um, and the, it grows really in those sort of deep south states. It grows best, at least the short staple cotton grows best in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Um, so the environments are pretty rough as well. So there's more mosquito-borne illnesses, the temperatures are hotter. So cotton was really, really kind of horrific on enslaved bodies. Um, so one of the things that's kind of fascinating about the cotton in American uh, history in terms of slavery is that it really saves the slave economy in the United States. And um, from 1800 to 1865, there's, called, there's what's called the, the Second Middle Passage, which is the movement of one million African Americans who were enslaved from the Eastern seaboard to these cotton plantations in the Deep South. So um, that's part of the reason why there was so much breaking up of families is that people were being sold off taken to these cotton plantations. So there was extreme disruptions and uh, there was a lot of fractured families in those cotton kingdoms because many had been brought from other locations. They'd either been gone over overland routes or through water routes. So uh, it took a while for families to reconstitute themselves. The labor was pretty brutal and it was a, a really a boom economy. And so um, enslavers pushed their enslaved workers really to the brink. And um, many of the studies that have kind of come out recently about the, the, the practices of planters um, just really show how much more physically punishing they were to their enslaved workers. So um, it's a little bit strange, but some people have started counting the number of lashes that enslaved people received on certain plantations. And what they find is that there's a kind of categorical difference between the amount of physical punishment on a cotton plantation versus a tobacco plantation. So it was a pretty, pretty tough um, life for those that do endure it. So final question uh, comes from Carrie. 
uh, up in Seattle. I think it's a nice one to end on. And I, I do apologize for not being able to get to everyone's question, um, but hopefully Professor Livesey will return in the, in the coming months. Um, it's about you. Uh, why were you drawn to focus on slavery in your work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I grew up in a, in a public school system, which didn't tell me much about slavery at all. All I knew was that slavery existed and that it was a bad thing. I didn't know anything else about it. I went to college and I was a history major. And um, I had to take a class my junior year to fulfill a requirement for the history major. And it was a comparative history course. And the only one they offered that semester was a comparative slavery course. And it was team taught by an African-American professor who specialized in the United States and a white professor who specialized in uh, the Caribbean. And I was really nervous about that class. I thought, oh gosh, I'm a white kid, don't know anything about this. I'm probably gonna just be, I'm just gonna be made to feel guilty the whole time. And this is gonna just be a really horrific experience. And I came in with a lot of baggage about what this might be like. And I had two very, very patient and, um, and compassionate professors who really walked everyone through just how central slavery was, not just to the United States, but to the Americas as a whole, and how you can't really understand American history without understanding that foundation of slavery. And it wasn't done to make people feel guilty. It wasn't done to um, antagonize anyone. It was just the, done to kind of edify and to make people aware of, of how we got to where we are today. And one of the things that it did is that it completely transformed not only my sense of American history, but it transformed my sense of what you can do with history. Because up to that point, I just thought, well, history is knowing who was the president or who the king and the queen was. It's just this history of big, important people who do big, important things. And in fact, history is the, the history of people who barely got any recognition or who were abused their whole lives or who weren't able to kind of make themselves important because of the restrictions placed on them. And I realized that they have a history too. And that really transformed my mind, my thinking, and it completely changed what I thought was important about history. And so from then on, I knew that this was a completely fascinating subject. I realized how crucial it was. And I said, I have to learn a lot more about this. So I applied to grad school saying, I'm going to study slavery because I know that there's a lot more to, to learn. So that's my personal history. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, all of you find your own directions to take. And I, I think history is one way to kind of get you into lots of different nooks and crannies of the world you wouldn't have expected otherwise. All right. Well, Professor Livesey, thank you so much from all of us at CMC and the Alumni and Parent Engagement Office. Uh, I'm going to um, click unmute so anyone can say goodbye and say thank you and uh, We'll give it just a few seconds before we uh, end the call. So thank you, everyone. Uh, you are all able to unmute or unmute or, or, or are unmuted. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great week. Thanks, thank everybody. You thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. It is. It is. Fascinating. Well, thank you all for attending. Yeah. Thank you. Come back again soon. Yes. <laughs> Please well, do. I don't have to